Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the second day of the second annual Open Simulator Community Conference 2014. Uh, we're really delighted to see everyone here this morning and very excited about a terrific program uh, for today's schedule. For those of you who are joining us for the first time today, um, we hope you enjoy the in-world conference facilities and have found your way to the keynote regions. Just as a reminder, be sure to check your groups. You should be in an OSCC zone group and you'll need to teleport to the corresponding keynote region of your zone group assignment. Um, so we'll hope to see you in the keynotes and, and uh, we hope that you enjoy today's program. So yesterday, at the first day of the conference, we had some really great sessions. Uh, the developer panel in the morning, uh, Philip Rosedale spoke about high fidelity and the metaverse yesterday afternoon, and we had a tremendous program of sessions in all of the breakout tracks. If you missed uh, the sessions yesterday, don't worry. We do have stream archives up and available on the Ustream channels. And if a recording is missing, we'll be doing some post-production work to get those sessions up as soon as we can. So if you missed yesterday's session, uh, you'll be able to view those streams uh, soon on the web. Today, we also have a really exciting program. Uh, coming up here shortly, I'll be introducing Steve Laval from Oculus VR, uh, who will be talking about their attempts to really bring VR to the mainstream audience, and that will be very exciting. Um, but I wanted to talk a little bit today. Yesterday, I did sort of a, I talked about where we have come from in the last year since the first Open Sim conference. Open Simulator itself, the platform, has come a long way uh, since our last uh, our last conference, and the technology surrounding virtual reality in the metaverse is uh, progressing so quickly. It's, it's such an exciting time. But today I thought I would talk a little bit about um, what it means to be a community. You know, we, we, we call this the Open Simulator Community Conference because it really is a, a sort of grassroots event. Um, and I just wanted to mention for those who are here for the first time today, some of the um, developments in the last year it's not only the technology developments, but I think it's also uh, the way that the community is working together in ways that perhaps it didn't in the past. Um, when we put out a call this year for volunteers, when we asked for moderators and greeters, uh, we had over 80 people reply. And when we asked for help uh, to cover the costs of this event, um, almost a third of everyone who registered chipped in as a crowd funder. So I just wanted to say thank you to all of our crowd funders and all of our volunteers and all of our staff um, who really are putting on a, a great event. And um, I think today is going to be hopefully a little smoother. Yesterday we had some glitches with streaming. Um, hopefully today things will go a little bit better on that end of things. Um, but you know, this event really wouldn't be possible without all of the people in the Open Simulator community who are working so hard to make uh, the platform great. And um, you know, one of the things that people often ask is, you know, how do I get more involved? Where do I find out more information if I'm looking to learn more about Open Simulator? And I thought I would make sure to share the main website for the Open Sim software is opensimulator.org. And if you haven't looked at the Open Simulator website, please do. There's tons of great information there. And the other thing that you can do if you're interested in being more involved with the community of developers and users is to join the mailing lists. And there are, I'm going to paste into local chat for those of you who are here in world. And I'll also put this in the stream for those of you uh, watching with the, the web stream. If you haven't joined a mailing list uh, for the OpenSim users or developers list, I would really encourage you to do that. Um, we're all so busy, everybody's got jobs and everybody's doing different things out in the metaverse and it's easy to sort of lose track, but the mailing lists are a really great way to keep in touch with the developers and to learn from all the other people using Open Simulator. Um, so it's a great place to ask questions and uh, to get help when you need it. And if you're thinking about running Open Simulator or running your own grid for the first time, um, it's amazing how many uh, brilliant people there are who can help you troubleshoot any problems that you're having. So if you haven't run an Open Sim grid, I would certainly encourage you to try. And uh, don't be afraid. And um, we'll hope to see more folks uh, out there joining the mailing list so we can keep in touch in between conferences. 
So uh, for those who are attending for the first time today, I also wanted to run through just a few quick housekeeping notes so you're comfortable with how things will work and, and hopefully keep things running smoothly today. Uh, we do encourage everyone to make sure that you have auto media, or I'm sorry, auto play checked for your streaming parcel and prim media. So if you haven't done that already, be sure to go into your viewer preferences and turn on auto play under, under the audio and video tab for both parcel and prim media. Some of our speakers are going to be using media on a prim and it'll work much better for you um, if you have autoplay turned on. We also ask that when you teleport in, when you teleport into a presentation space, um, it would be really helpful if you could sit as soon as you get in. So any of the breakout spaces or here on the keynotes, as soon as you teleport into the region and things res for you, uh, make sure to sit. That will really help the performance of the simulators. Um, you may have seen in your email today, hopefully everyone got a message, that we did convert all of the streaming tickets to in-world tickets. Um, the grid performed so well yesterday, we didn't have any, you know, any real problems with, with performance. So we've opened the floodgates and everyone who wanted to um, come in world can today. So we're expecting, hopefully, um, to see uh, a little bit bigger crowd so it makes it even more important that everybody sit in those presentation spaces so, um, so that the, the simulators can handle the load. Of course, in all the other regions, um, you can feel free to walk around and explore. And um, I would also, if you haven't yet, uh, we have a, a little game going in the grid here called the Open Meta Quest, and it's testing your knowledge about the metaverse. And uh, the game has some really fantastic prizes. So if you haven't had a chance to play that today, um, I hope you'll take the time. Uh, you have to sort of uh, search for the clues, and they're in various regions around the grid. Um, particularly the expo regions where our sponsors have really great booths and, and uh, fun things to do in the expo regions. So if you haven't had a chance to do that, um, please, please do. And then finally, um, if you're having any technical issues, uh, our staff are around in the regions all day today. You should notice they're wearing blue OSCC staff shirts. Feel free to ask them for help. Um, if you have questions, if you're having trouble hearing or seeing, um, or if you're not sure where to go, they'll be able to um, assist you with anything that you need. Um, and if you're having account issues, if you're watching this on the web and you haven't been able to get in world, please do check the FAQ page on our website first. And if that doesn't solve your problem, then you can feel free to email us for help at opensim, uh, opensim at avacon.org. Okay. Um, we'll be streaming, obviously, live throughout the day on all of the various track channels. You can see the full conference program on our website at conference.opensimulator.org. The streaming link will appear at the top of every session description, so you can always check out what's happening with all the different tracks on the web. And you can tweet uh, with the hashtag OSCC or OSCC14, and um, we'll be watching for your questions and comments on Twitter. So with that, I think we're probably ready uh, to introduce our, our keynote speaker today. Um, I'm sure that everyone who's watching and in the audience um, was as excited as I was um, with the announcement of Oculus Rift. The, the uh, first time that I wore the Dev Kit 1, it's been some time since I had a sort of technological, really like a wow moment where uh, you have that feeling that, oh gosh, this is a game changer. And the first time that I tried the, the Rift, I had that, I, like I got goosebumps. I'm getting goosebumps again thinking about it. it. It's sort of that realization that the way that we've been interacting with this technology can be so much better um, that it, it's, it really is a game changer. And then the difference between uh, the Dev Kit 1 and the Dev Kit 2, if you've had the opportunity to try it, um, again, it's just shocking how, um, how much presence you feel being in the virtual. And I, I think that the excitement around the Rift has really reignited the discussions about virtual reality and the metaverse and um, all of the technology that we're working so hard to uh, bring to users. And I'm, I'm absolutely delighted to have 
uh, Steve Laval here today from Oculus VR to talk about um, what they're doing and what their plans for the Rift um, uh, will be. So Steve started working with Oculus um, uh, you know, just a few days after its successful Kickstarter campaign, and he's been leading their R&D efforts and led them up to their acquisition uh, by Facebook last year, or the, earlier this year. Uh, he developed perceptually tuned head tracking methods based on IMUs and computer vision, and he's also led a team of perceptual psychologists to provide uh, principled approaches to virtual reality system calibration and the design of comfortable user experiences, which, as we know, is, is so important. He's also a professor of computer science at the University of Illinois, and he has worked in robotics for over 20 years. Um, he's perhaps best known for his introduction of the rapidly exploring random trees algorithm of motion planning, and uh, he has a book called Planning Algorithms. So thank you, Steve, uh, and welcome. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thanks for the introduction and for the opportunity to speak here today. Um, I, I really, really appreciate this. And um, I became uh, familiar with Open Simulator um, a couple of years ago um, because while working at Oculus, um, I lived on one side of the UC Irvine campus and the um, Oculus headquarters was on the other side of the campus, so outside of the campus, but in, in the back of the campus. And I rode my bike across it to work uh, every day and, um, and in the process stopped in a lot and got to know a lot of the great uh, faculty at UC Irvine and um, Walt Skaki and um, Krista Lopez. And Krista Lopez and I talked a lot about Open Simulator and I was very excited about the, the project and the effort. And so, um, so I'm really glad to speak here today. Um, so the title of my talk is uh, Virtual Reality, How Real Should It Be? And um, I'll give you some ideas about that as we go along here. Let me uh, change to the next slide. Um, so Fleep already gave some um, idea about my background. I thought I would talk a little bit about that. Um, so um, I've spent over two decades as a robotics researcher and in the process got familiar with um, a lot of um, say mathematical problems, uh, especially involving sensing and filtering and motions through three-dimensional space. And um, my, 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 most of my background has been in the area of motion planning, where if you see the, um, the, the images up there, those, those are taken from uh, Marcelo Kalman's work, who's a professor at UC Merced, University of California, Merced. Um, suppose you want to um, tell um, a humanoid robot to reach into a refrigerator and grab something. You would like to give it a very high level command and then have the computer or the algorithm figure out all the intermediate motions to accomplish that so that um, no accidental collisions occur and uh, hopefully the motions look reasonably realistic. So of course already that deals with, um, um, to, to develop these algorithms and develop software for them, we, we're very comfortable with uh, virtual environments and simulations in those environments and some basic physics and kinematics and these kinds of things. Um, mainly for the purpose originally of providing tools for robots, but then these algorithms ended up being used all over the place. Um, well, outside of that, um, some by people in the, in the game community and um, many other areas such as virtual prototyping and, and so forth. So, um, so I find it very interesting that I was able to get close to the, 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 the game world, uh, video games and, and um, the software engineering kinds of aspects of that um, by having a robotics background that kind of ports over to that, let's say. Um, so I've also been a professor at the University of Illinois. I've worked at uh, Stanford and Iowa State before. So I mainly have an academic background and I'm mainly gonna give some, let's say research oriented kinds of ideas and thoughts. And so I, I probably, as a researcher, I, I tend to find more questions than I answer. So I, I think uh, many times figuring out the right question to ask is the hard part, trying to identify the problem. So, um, so that's the kind of thing I'll be focusing on today rather than talking about super technical details on what we did before. Um, I want to talk more about what some of the interesting uh, challenges or problems are. And uh, finally, I'd like to say, I, I, I certainly love open source, so it's very exciting to see Open Simulator. Um, we've written some open source, um, you know, small libraries for doing motion planning and doing sampling of transformation groups that are related to those um, kinds of problems. Also, um, uh, my, my textbook planning algorithms was um, has been online for free. I've always been 
Um, I didn't make it open in the sense that anybody could go and edit it like Wikipedia, but um, it's been open for um, at least to the community as a, as a free textbook. It was also published by Cambridge Press, but it was very important for me to make it open for anybody to download and access uh, since about 2004. And that was actually how I got into Oculus because um, people were searching for uh, some of the basic concepts, some of the basic kinematics, quaternions, some of the basic mathematics that were needed for head tracking, and they came across parts of my book. So I had no prior background in, in virtual reality or in the game industry or in industry in general, but uh, got in that way a couple of years ago. So some of that came about because of my efforts to make things open and available to the community. So I think that's a, an excellent model. Um, so oh, let me advance to the next slide here. So to talk a little bit about my work at Oculus, so, um, and this is actually related to open source in the sense that uh, my, my first uh, six months while working at Oculus, which started um, a, a few days uh, after the Kickstarter, I was um, uh, started off working as a consultant and I was in Northern Finland at the time working in the city of Oulu. Um, I was attracted to Finland for a number of reasons. I was, work I was on a sabbatical working on a book project. So I needed to have some sort of distance from my daily job in order to focus on the book I was writing on sensing and filtering, which ended up being related to head tracking for Oculus as well. But um, I also chose Finland because um, it's the home of Linux, and, is, and I've always been curious about the culture that, that of, of the Nordic countries in Europe that contributed so much to open source and pioneered so much of that. And so I thought it was great to be immersed in that culture for, for a while. But uh, somewhere in the middle, I ended up pulling out of there unexpectedly early and moved straight to Irvine, California to work with the, um, the Oculus team. Um, and so, so it was in September of 2012 when I started with Oculus, doing some of the basic uh, math coding and um, kinematics, uh, working on the basics of head tracking. Ended up working. Uh, my wife Anna, your show was in the picture there, so we ended up working together. We also had a robot there in the in the apartment in Finland that had the um, DK1 sensor board on it, and we were doing uh, calibration studies and uh, sensor tracking performance studies. Um, and so, um, so that's how, how I sort of got into things. Um, when I ended up going to Oculus and joined full time, taking leave from the university in March, um, ended up being the, the head scientist, worked on all sorts of things, uh, mainly around head tracking. But then eventually, as I'll give some indications in my talk, I got very excited about human factors, uh, perceptual psychology, and human vision. It became very clear right away that. Um, that, that, that we have to understand how the human body works at, at some of the lowest levels in order to really make, um, to really make VR effective. And um, this especially became clear even at something as, I would think as, as maybe distant or separated from human factors as just simple head tracking, it ended up being very important even for that. And I'll talk about that in a bit. Um, so, that's, so that's kind of where things came along. And then this summer I returned back to the University of Illinois. So I, I live back in Illinois. That's where I'm talking to you from today from central Illinois. So I'm a, a half-time resuming faculty member there and half-time uh, working for uh, Oculus VR. Let's see, go to the next slide. So what was my motivation for jumping in? So I didn't have prior virtual reality experience. I did have prior experience um, with Second Life. Over a decade ago, I was experimenting a lot with that just in my own free time for fun and um, really enjoyed that. I really enjoyed the opportunity to interact with people, to try different avatars and had a lot of fun with that. And I always wondered what the next generation of that would be like, even if I wasn't working directly in the area. Um, virtual reality research was very expensive. The, the, the equipment was expensive. Uh, it was difficult to build a big lab to do that. And um, it's very hard to make comfortable experiences, certainly 10 years ago or more. Um, I had an additional personal interest. Um, so so one, one perspective that motivated me, while I was in fact uh, living in Europe and Finland in my previous sabbatical, um, in 2004, I was living in Poland. That's where I wrote my book on planning algorithms. And um, my connection to Poland is that um, my grandmother and her sister were separated um, after World War II. And uh, my mom came to the United States when she was about five years old with my grandmother, but my grandmother was not able to find her sister. They were both, um, they're both Polish, but they were displaced in Germany working on uh, farms there. Um, they're agricultural uh, workers. They're from small villages. And so they only got to see each other uh, twice in 60 years after that. Um, and it was really an unfortunate situation in some ways because my um, um, my, my grandmother and, and her sister had an aunt in St. Louis, Missouri in, 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 in the U.S. And so she really wanted to bring both of them. But they were separated. And I ended up bringing my grandmother there for that picture uh, there in 1993. She was 73 at the time. And um, I never really could get my grandma to go back there again. And so they talked by phone. You know, they, before that, they wrote letters. They, they talked by phone. 
I, a couple of times, got them to have a video Skype conversation. I thought that was really nice. But I thought, wow, it would be really great for people who are distributed around the world, um, especially if they have limited mobility. As I watched my grandma and her sister age even more, um, the, 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 the trip became so uncomfortable that imagine being able to, attain, to, um, to attend um, things like um, uh, birthdays and weddings of family members, grandchildren, perhaps on the other side of the world, and more generally, not necessarily just for elderly people who are separated far from family, but people with limited mobility in general. Um, I found that really an inspiring kind of application of virtual reality. It was exciting enough for me. Um, it was exciting enough for me to, um, to, to, to jump into this. Um, in addition to all the other industry and applications and such, I just found this a really personal, um, interesting concept. Um, so let's see, I'm gonna go to the next slide. <clears throat> um, I'm kind of wond wondering as, I, as I've gotten in, what is virtual reality? I've, I've noticed um, in, in recent talks of Philip Rosedale, who of course spoke yesterday, uh, has given um, an interesting definition that I like and, and um, he gave this one at SVBR conference a few months ago. Um, virtual reality is a sensory experience in which the results of our actions are consistent with past experiences. Um, as he was commenting, there's a lot of not so satisfying definitions that are very much pinned to the current technology rather than, let's say, the effect that it has on the human body or how the human interacts with these artificial worlds that we construct. Um, the Merriam-Webster um, definition that I, that, I, that I looked up was also, as I was poking around, also seemed fairly satisfying, an artificial environment which is experienced through sensory stimuli, such as sight and sounds, provided by a computer and in which one's actions are uh, partially determine what happens in the environment. So I, I um, went through some iterations yesterday, tried to come up with some 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 definitions and concepts, and and try, tried to refine a, a definition. And one of the things I came up with is um, I wanted to make it a little more general than humans because I, I, I became aware recently of a a body of literature of uh, virtual reality being applied to insects, animals, all sorts of other organisms, and. And the reason why I find that fascinating is because I want to emphasize the fact that we are an organism, a living organism that's caught up in this technology while we are using it. And it's sometimes easy to forget that while we're immersed in it, but it ends up being very important to, rem to, to, um, to remember that and to pay attention to that, to focus on that as we um, develop these kinds of systems. So, so one definition, and I reserve the right to, to refine my definitions in the future, but one, one definition I found reasonably satisfying today is um, that it involves inducing targeted behavior in an organism, a living organism, by using artificial sensory stimulation while the organism has little or no awareness of the interference. So, and that last clause, by that I, I'm sort of alluding to um, um, the feeling of, of immersion and higher than that, the feeling of presence, but um, uh, with not necessarily any direct uh, reference to consciousness or other things like that, but just, you know, you're, you're, um, so you're, you're behaving in some kind of targeted way. The technology that's been used is, is causing you to behave in some targeted way, but you're not really very aware of that or concerned with that while you're experiencing it. Um, so the, the reason why I, I, I use the word organism, I was just thinking about, um, you know, we are, we are animals of some kind, and, um, and so we're, we're presented with some sort of alternative stimuli, and that's causing us to behave in some way that's familiar to us. So I often think about, um, if in the upper left there, you see, I often think about um, uh, gerbils on a, on, a, um, on a circular wheel, so, so running along. And so um, it's known that rodents somehow comfortably um, take off running and get a lot of exercise, um, even though they're in a cage. They, they seem to go into this mode where they're perfectly happy to run almost forever and, and, and to a point of exhaustion inside of a wheel. And um, humans, in our efforts to try to get more exercise, you know, it was the case that um, we got plenty of exercise in the wild. and. Then uh, after enough technology improvements, uh, so-called improvements, uh, we end up sitting around and not doing very much. And so people invented treadmills to get the same kind of feeling. You feel a little bit immersed, I suppose, in the fact that the ground is moving and you feel like you're running along. Um, of course, it gets boring pretty fast unless you have some visual stimuli. And obviously, you can connect VR to treadmills. And that kind of leads to the bottom part of the slide, which is um, you know, people have applied virtual reality to insects. There's an example there of a... Um, of a, a cockroach running on a, a spherical foam ball, and it goes running along on essentially an omnidirectional treadmill, but the cockroach is presented with visual stimuli. And this was actually done by, by researchers, a physicist at the University of Oulu in, in Northern Finland, coincidentally the same place where I was when I started uh, consulting for Oculus, but I, I didn't even know about this work at the time. And um, they, they studied the, um, the neural activity of the insect while it goes running along, and essentially it becomes seemingly unaware that it's that its environment's been manipulated somehow and um 
And then when I see something like the um, see the OmniTread um, um, virtual reality um, um, extension or um, peripheral um, in the in the in the lower right there. Um, you, you see humans wanting to do the same kinds of things when they're presented with artificial visual stimuli. So, so I just think, again, I want to emphasize the organism part of it and the, 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 or, or in our particular case, the human side of it to understand that to, to, to engineer these systems effectively, it's very important to consider the, um, um, the, 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 the interaction between the human and, the, um, um, and this technology that's being presented to it or the stimulation that's being presented to it. All right. So how real should virtual reality be? I, I made that the title of my talk. Um, so it depends on what you want to do, I guess, is, is the, the easy way out of the question. Um, so one thing, of course, is to, is to target on the task. Um, I sort of take that, that, that kind of approach because I, I, the same thing has happened to me in robotics in that um, if, you, if you want to make a general purpose robot and you're not quite sure what you want it to do, it tends to drive the performance specs to a very high level. Um, we might imagine, oh, I just would like to maybe make a humanoid robot that has all the capabilities of humans, and then it can handle all the different kinds of tasks that maybe I can imagine. Um, perhaps I can go beyond what humans can do and design the robot with more and more exotic capabilities. But very often, we have a very targeted application, like maybe the goal is just to vacuum the floors, and then you end up with a robot that doesn't look like a humanoid pushing a vacuum cleaner. You end up with something very uh, specific for that. And so at the, at the higher levels in the way that VR gets used, um, I, I, think, I think we should think like that as well. Think very much about the task. What's the targeted kind of application that you're designing it for? And so um, you know, maybe you want to take a university course. Um, so um, as an educator, I think about that. So what aspects are going to be most effective for learning in that situation? Um, maybe you want to maintain a long-distance relationship. So um, that would probably involve a different set of um, – different amount of interaction, I would say, or different level of interaction than uh, taking a university course. Maybe you want to play a first-person shooter game. Maybe it's networked. Maybe you're playing it alone. Um, maybe you want virtual travel, like the example I gave with my grandma and her sister. Perhaps, um, um, perhaps you want to feel you, you want the people, the participants, to feel like they really are in some familiar place. Or if it's really virtual travel, maybe they want to go to some place and become familiar with it that they haven't seen before, but they've heard so much about. So um, you may want to take a trip to another country. Um, maybe hang out on the beach. And so um, maybe the levels of realism in that case become much more important. Um, perhaps you want to watch a live theater performance or, um, or recorded performance. Could be a movie-like performance. Perhaps you want to sit in a virtual movie theater. So what kinds of things are needed for that? Um, and finally, um, maybe you want to sit and write code um, in, the, in the virtual environment. So um, what should it look like to be able to do that effectively? Can you do that? In, in, you know, can the technology get to a point where um, you'd rather write code inside of VR than sitting in front of a couple of giant monitors. Um, so I think it's uh, it's very interesting. And and for each one of these kinds of tasks and many more that are that are coming up, um, the, the 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 amount of sort of realism or so-called realism really depends on what you're trying to do for the task, what you're trying to accomplish. Um, however, in spite of all of that, I do want to emphasize, and that's something I'll, I'll get into in a bit here, is that it's important to maintain a certain baseline, which is that um, we have to maintain a certain level of comfort and safety. Um, and in addition, belief in the sense that you're, you're immersed, you feel present there. But the first two parts, comfort and safety, are, are something that um, we took very seriously. And, and of course, that's the part that you know, um, has the potential and, and has, had the, 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 um, has been most difficult for VR in terms of getting it to be adopted in a widespread way is to make sure that it's a comfortable experience for everyone, especially for long-term use. And so I want to give some insights into where we came from with that and the kinds of things that we've been thinking about and what I think the community should be thinking about in general. Um, <clears throat> so, as I said, in my own work, I started off with um, working on head tracking for the uh, first development kit. And so what are we doing for that? Well, we have an inertial measurement unit that uh, basically is measuring uh, linear accelerations and angular velocities from a, um, uh, from a gyroscope, it's a, from a gyroscope, which is a, a MEMS uh, device, which is um, the same type of technology that you have in your smartphones, um, but perhaps a little more advanced in terms of specifications. But it's all leveraging that kind of technology, which we're very grateful to have that. In addition to the display technology um, that, that came from the smartphone industry, that enables you to get fairly close to a comfortable experience um, right out of the box, which is what was able to happen with DK1 um, after you solved the software challenges. 
So um, I, I ended up applying my, my robotics background, which involves a lot of um, searching and sampling on the space of 3D uh, transformations. And so not just applying transformations, but really understanding the space of all transformations. And in that case, you know, developing efficient algorithms that avoid numerical problems, avoid singularities, kinematic problems that are well known in the aerospace industry, for example, or if you make flying robots, they're well known, um, known by motion planning people. Um, so it ends up being a kind of tracking problem um, on the, the space of, of 3D rotations for DK1. It ends up being on the space of rotations and translations for uh, DK2, which I'll mention briefly in just a bit. Um, so um, a lot of the, the code we ended up writing um, ends up just being careful over quaternion space and finding the right representations to make things simple and efficient and clean for that. And hopefully um, hide some of the... Um, hide as much as possible as possible of the complexity that developers don't need to deal with on a daily basis um, to make their job easier. So stuff gets sort of hidden. Um, as we start getting into the, the human perception side, I should say that um, one of the challenges we had is that if you just take gyro data and start numerically integrating that, you end up with a problem called drift. And before too long, um, the world becomes tilted. We can use accelerometer data to try to correct the tilt. But if you correct the tilt too quickly, then um, people might start to feel seasick because they perceive the corrections being applied. All of a sudden, you feel the world tilting. Um, so you want to correct it very slowly. But if you correct it too slowly, then, um, then it's not keeping up, and then the world will eventually end up tilted in the end um, after a longer period of time if you're applying a slow rate of correction. So we had to use a robot to study the maximum rate that could happen. It turns out the faster you turn your head, the, the faster the errors tend to accumulate from the way the MEM, MEM sensors work, so the drift rates would grow faster. So we had to make sure, after doing a lot of experiments over several different sensors in a collection, because there's variation across sensors, there's temperature dependencies, all kinds of crazy things come in. You just want to make sure over the entire kind of collection of misbehaving sensors, let's say, that um, the corrections you apply are above that threshold, so that they're guaranteed to clamp down and compensate for this tilt drift but they're not too high that, that you end up perceiving them greatly. So luckily we're able to get into this kind of sweet spot where we could apply the corrections and you don't notice them happening so much. Um, they're kind of below the, the, the thresholds it seems to be. Um, same thing happened with yaw correction. We had funny problems with, um, as people were playing cockpit games, the cockpit gradually started sliding over to the side because um, even though we corrected for tilt, um, you had problems of not being able to, um, um, to figure out you had problems um, determining which way you're facing. And so we ended up um, having to work initially with an uncalibrated magnetometer and figure out ways to just kind of get it automatically calibrated and working while, while developers were not even aware of that happening. Magnetometers are very difficult to work with. They're not exactly like a compass in the pure ideal sense. Um, I wrote some, some blog posts on that if you find that more, this kind of thing interesting. I'm not here to talk about the details of that too much, but, um, but I found it... Um, um, Anyway, really challenging and fascinating to, to eventually solve the problem so that you're more or less facing in the same direction rather than wrapping around in your chair gradually over time and getting tangled up in the cables while playing a first while playing a um, cockpit game. So um, getting into the, the, the human sides of it even more, um, we had to deal with latency. So anyone who's worked in virtual reality knows that, that latency is the um, has been the most serious um, cited problem for a very long time. And... Um, you know, the, the problem is that when you when you turn your head, the um, the images that you see should appear to be in the right places, right? If I'm sitting here right now, right now, I'm, even though, as you can see, the the, um, the 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 Oculus Rift appears to be on, the, on my forehead, so I'm not actually in virtual reality. I'm actually um, looking at a screen. So as I turn my head and I look at different people in the audience on um, in the screen here, um, I don't I don't perceive a problem with latency. I can look at um, I can look at your various avatars in the audience here. Everything's fine. But um, in virtual reality, you turn your head and the images have to keep up, right? You have to present your eyes, your body, with what it expects to see. And so there's some delay in that. Um, you, you measure using your sensors, um, send that over USB. There's a little engine picture there. Um, this is a, um, I took this slide from, from, from the uh, other people inside of Oculus. And so the engine represents the game engine. So it's going and calculating along what the scene should look like. And then you scan that out. And the pixels all have to switch, which with the development kit one took up to 20 milliseconds for pixels to switch, depending on the color and brightness differences. Um, you ended up noticing that as a kind of blurring, but eventually you, you get out this result, which could take, oh, 30 to 50 milliseconds or longer if your game engine is taking a lot of time. Um, and so that ended up being a difficult problem. 
uh, we decided to attack that problem from two different ends. Um, one of them is to use uh, time warping, which is an idea that's been around for a while. You may have heard of image shifting or image warping, which is after the gain engine step, when you have updated the world, you do some, you, you grab new sensor readings and perform some quick um, post-processing, let's say, to the, to the images that you've generated to try to fix them as well as you can. Um, it doesn't solve all problems. There are fundamental uh, visibility issues. You can look up visibility algorithms if you're interested in those kinds of problems. Um, 3D visibility and 2D visibility algorithms, all kinds of interesting issues come up. You can't see features that were invisible when you did the calculations before, but um, it does help significantly. Um, the part I worked on mainly was predictive tracking. And um, there's a lot I could say about that. It was, it's an interesting technology and in that predictive tracking has been around for a long time, but in virtual reality, um, researchers who worked on it in the 90s mostly felt that it wasn't very helpful because you had to predict too far ahead into the future and they didn't really have enough sensor data to really predict the trend. In modern times, it ends up being a lot easier because the sensor data that we think is very dense, it's no problem to get gyro readings at 1,000 hertz and it's quite accurate to, to, to get the angular acceleration directly and then try to extrapolate what that's going to look like. Oh, 20 to 30 milliseconds into the future is not so hard. The, the one thing I like to say a lot is that uh, there's no free will at 20 milliseconds. The natural momentum of your head is going to pretty much enable us to predict what you're going to do. When it gets up to 100 milliseconds or more, then it gets much harder to predict what you're going to do. So, um, so, so, so that ends up um, being kind of a counterintuitive surprise for people who have worked in this field longer. Um, so one of the things I discovered that really made me interested in um, um, perceptual psychology is that as we started making predictive tracking methods, um, I just this just shows you a simple plot. Um, I guess I can't illustrate this too easily. I did I didn't make a um, um, an animation script for this, but if I just if I just nod my head back and forth in like a no gesture, turning side to side, then um, I, I looked at the angular error that we got from the tracking method that we have. And if we did no prediction at all, then in the average case we had like an, a degree and a half at some you know reasonably sane kind of speed of turning my head back and forth. And the worst case error could be up to <clears throat> about five degrees or so. <clears throat> so I was really happy with this method that just extrapolates the angular velocity to predict the trend. Everything went down. People used it. It only took a couple hours to hack up on a um, on, on a weekend while I was, was consulting way back a couple years ago. But um, but then I got a little fancier, got a little overconfident, and tried to make a method that used acceleration in addition. So it tried to really estimate the trend in terms of both velocity and acceleration. And the average error and worst case error were less when I did my experiment. So being a great, uh, you know, thinking of myself as a good scientist and a reasonable engineer, I thought, well, this is going to be better. Everyone's going to love it. So I showed it to my colleagues, and um, it was an interesting surprise. When they tried it, the, the best method was actually uh, worse. So this, this, this new method that had better angular error in the worst case and better angular error in the average case ended up being a worse experience. And I thought, oh, that can't be, but, uh, but I really trusted. One of my colleagues at Oculus, Peter Geocaris, he was the the lead for um, for um, Unity, so for, for for bringing Oculus to Unity. So that was the main thing he worked on. He was also very sensitive um, in his uh, in his outside of work life. He's an audiophile DJ. Was very sensitive to distortions and problems in audio systems. And I think he kind of mapped those skills over to video problems. And so he said, "Take a look at this new new uh, tracking method you made. And when you just stare in one place in virtual reality, my new method had a little more jitter in it." But he said, when you turn your head, I agree that you know it looks perfect. It looks much better. So the angular error was in fact less when you turn your head, but the um, but the jitter was a little bit worse too. So it turns out that as you try to be more aggressive with prediction, in other words, as you try to see the future, it tends to introduce more jitter. And in some sense, prediction is the opposite of smoothing, which causes latency. So if you try to smooth data out, just like this um, kind of moving average I show in the plot there, then the the, the red line is the trend that comes from making a moving average. So smoothing, no matter what you do, it tends to introduce latency. Um, and so prediction is like the opposite of that. As you try to reach into the future and try to predict what's going to happen, it tends to amplify jitter or increase jitter. Um, so, so given that that's the case, it, it, it caused me to think about it and make perceptually tuned filtering. So where it had two kinds of extreme modes. So when you're not, when you're not um, turning your head very quickly, say you're mainly remaining stationary, that's when you perceive jitter, so human perception is coming in, but not latency. And then when you do a quick motion, you perceive latency, but not jitter. So the idea was to do perceptually tuned filtering, which is not like a standard kind of filtering or tracking method that you find in 
control and dynamical systems literature and standard methods applied to robotics because there's a there's a human in the loop here with very low amount of latency. So it becomes very important to get these things right. So we predict further when moving quickly, but we do little or no prediction when stationary and instead do more smoothing. And so that's how um, um, we ended up um, um, do, uh, introducing these kind of uh, tracking methods with the with the um, with the orientation only uh, work. Then, of course, eventually, again, considering human factors, you need to introduce um, um, position tracking as well, because you could move your whole body side to side, let's say, without rotating your head. And then it becomes disturbing to not see um, the changes that your, your brain expects in the world. So we eventually added positional tracking as the latest uh, development kit, too. We also worked on some of the other kinds of problems, which is um, making the pixels switch faster. So switching to OLED technology uh, helped with that. We can switch the pixels very fast. They switch down to, oh, I think about 80 microseconds or so, rather than problems of up to 20 milliseconds. So it's quite fast switching. If you leave the pixels on for the entire frame, then you get a problem called judder. So it kind of looks more like you're looking at a, se you, you perceive more of a sequence of images rather than a continuous fluid motion. So because of that, we flicker the display. So you turn it on, let's say for uh, typical numbers, like a couple of milliseconds, and then it's off for the rest of the time, pitch black. Then you have a problem of perceiving flicker, which might remind you of problems on, you know, if you're old enough to remember CRT monitors and using those, um, there were ergonomic standards and recommendations that the refresh rate needed to be well above 60 hertz. It needed to be above 70, 75, typically 85 was, was, was a high comfortable number. So um, we're, 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 we're striving to achieve those same levels of comfort. We have 75 hertz for DK2, but um, we're going to be continued to be continuing to be motivated to make it um, an even higher refresh rate um, to make sure that we have it very comfortable. Also, we, we are increasing the um, um, display resolutions as much as possible. So um, DK2 is 1080p, um, and um, Crescent Bay prototype that was shown at our, our um, recent developers conference is even higher than that. Things are going to continue to go higher up until we reach comfortable, let's say, limits of human perception, because it's, again, the human is really important here. Um, so, what, so, so I now want to switch to a, to a, a part in the talk here where um, I want to give some different ideas of um, what happens. Again, this is um, human-centered or human-oriented, but some of the kinds of problems we have where um, I thought this would be appropriate for the, um, um, for the people who have experience with Open Simulator and with Second Life in that um, we have problems adapting our expertise. So, um, and, and so, so for those of you who have extensive amounts of experience um, dealing with this, this platform that you've contributed to, that you develop on, or that you just um, enjoy for entertainment purposes, whatever you might be doing with it, perhaps it's education, um, I, I think there's, there's, um, it's important to not be overconfident as you move into virtual reality. So um, just to give a couple of examples, um, that's a quote from the original Tron movie there. On the other side of the screen, it all looks so easy. So some things that look kind of easy on a screen end up not working so well in virtual reality. Um, so, so here's a couple of examples. So the, the, the panel on the left um, shows an adaptation that was made to a, to, to a game. So one, one of the um, first-person shooters that, that, that we adapted for VR, if you just keep all of the geometry, the camera views, the cutscenes, all these kind of things the same, it quickly leads to uncomfortable experiences in a lot of cases. And in some of the cases, there ends up being, I think, kind of odd social cues happen. And so here's one of the cases where um, on the left there, um, th th that was rendered for, for viewing on a screen. But if you put the virtual camera in the same place in virtual reality, you end up looking right at the center of the image, and that makes the person feel like they're short. right? And so... Um, and so ju just as I know many of you, have, you can easily change your avatar height in, uh, in the Open Simulator and in Second Life. And so you've had a lot of chance to experiment with uh, uh, avatars of different heights. Um, I know um, uh, people have done studies on that as well. Uh, Jeremy Balenson at Stanford, for example, has ex experimented with how people interact um, in uh, Second Life environments um, with a variety of different kinds of avatars. So this is accidental in this case. People ended up being very short and asking, why am I so short in this space? Well, it wasn't intended. It's just that it was adapted directly from a screen. Same thing for the panel on the right. Um, this particular character ended up looking much more intimidating in virtual reality than on a screen. So um, the, the character was very large and powerful looking. And um, that, that sense of presence has quite a different, um, say, social communication that it causes, right? Um, social implication that it causes. So I find that interesting. So, so as you move from... Um, this environment that you're comfortable with, looking at, um, 
at this virtual environment through big screens and move into virtual reality. I just want to um, sensitize you to these kinds of problems and issues if you haven't experienced it already. Chances are many of you have already seen these kinds of things, in which case, sorry for if I'm beating a dead horse, but I, for, for, but, um, I, I, I've never ceased to be amazed at how often in all the aspects as we develop for virtual reality that our confidence that we bring in, bring to the table, let's say, ends up working against us. You know, the experience or expertise works against us. So being aware of what you know that's useful and what you know that's counterproductive and being able to separate those out ends up being one of the most important skills in this space. Um, so, so again, doing simple kinds of adaptations, let's think about the problem of locomotion, right? So I can take the, uh, the keys here on my keyboard and I can move my avatar around. Um, I don't think I'll do that right now. I'm afraid to screw things up, but um, I'll just keep standing here. Um, yes, yeah, so I'll just keep standing here at the podium, but um, um, I won't mess things up. But um, um, so, so as you move your avatar around, um, move yourself forwards, backwards, side to side, called strafing. Maybe you might want to do torso rotation. But um, most of the people are experiencing virtual reality sitting sitting in a chair. Um, for safety reasons, we certainly recommend that to the vast majority of people, unless you've really carefully um, set up your environment for walking around. Um, you can do a lot of damage to yourself or your hardware. Um, and so most people are sitting down, so we mostly recommend, and that's where uh, the, the products so far have been targeted. Um, so as you're doing that, that's all perfectly fine. Maybe while you're looking at a screen, it's reasonably comfortable, and it simulates very much how we walk around in the, in the real world. So that feels great. It's compatible with that. However, as you get into virtual reality, uh, something gets in the way, which is the vestibular system. So our vestibular um, organs, um, the vestibular system has two main components behind each of our ears. And what I found really fascinating as I studied that is that it contains sensors that are almost identical to the sensors that we're using to track the head. So I thought that was really incredible. Um, here we are making this technology using MEM sensors that we weren't really trying to mimic the brain with them. We're trying to mimic the human body with them. We were just trying to get the engineering information that we needed to, to, um, to provide the right visual stimulation to the eyes. And working against us are the, the body's natural sensors that are trained to measure the same things and let us know that everything's going right in the world, helping us with balance and comfort in the real world. And so um, I found it really amazing. The semicircular canals um, measure um, angular acceleration, which is very close to the angular velocity provided by the, um, by the MEMS sensors that we use. And they ended up being... Um, designed in such a way in our bodies so that there's three orthogonal axes that they're measuring along, much like the three axis gyros that we have. Just blows my mind. It was incredible to me. Like, wow, there's the three axis gyro right there in our heads. Two of them, in fact. And then the, um, the otolith organs called the utricle and saccule end up measuring linear acceleration. And you get all three degrees of freedom from that. Um, it actually has some redundancy at the end. It's actually providing four degrees of freedom worth of measurements at least. But um, nevertheless, you can transform it and it provides exactly the kind of data. Um, I didn't find a magnetometer in our heads, but um, you know, some animals have things like that as well, of course, as you know. All right, so the interesting thing is as you try to do locomotion, you have a problem called vection. Um, this is the illusion of self-motion. So the problem is you're trying to move your character along and you perceive optical flow with your vision system. I'm just showing some arrows here as uh, flow lines so that as you track features in the environment, especially at your periphery where you're not really focused on it, but in a wide field of view virtual reality system, which we're all excited about, your body ends up being most sensitive to this, even though you're not focusing on it directly. And um, you, many of you may have experienced vection before. If, um, if you're in the United States, for example, you're, you're, you've been stuck in traffic before. If you're in Europe or Asia, you've been stopped on a train before, let's say. Um, of course, we all have experience of both, perhaps. But um, more commonly in Europe and Asia, you may be stuck in a train. And um, you um, notice at your periphery that the, uh, that the train out the window to the side um, starts moving. But actually, you perceive yourself as moving backwards. And it's a bit disorienting, right? Usually, you, you catch yourself pretty quickly. Maybe it only takes a couple of seconds. Oh, wow, I'm not moving backwards. The other train's moving forward. Well, that's an example of vection, and yeah, it's quite disorienting. And in virtual reality, if you're not careful, people are doing that all the time in a careless way and for very long periods of time. So that's not a flaw of the hardware technology itself. The hardware may be quite comfortable. It's that the experience has been designed to keep causing vection for you over and over again, right? So um, 
Um, so, 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 so it's very interesting that we're causing this, this sort of well-known phenomenon for vision scientists, people who study human vision, and, um, and this mismatch is being caused um, intentionally to try to get more realism. It's just important to understand that this realism comes at a cost. So um, I, I found it really interesting. So once I understood this mismatch, you know, I, I, I find, you know, as many areas of research, I find that I reach different levels of understanding. So my first level was, hmm, what is vestibular mismatch? I don't know nothing about this. So I started researching it and presented some of the things like I just showed you. Then um, people start to say, and I hear this comment from people, they say, well, okay, so moving in VR while motionless in the physical world is bad. That's a bad mismatch. And then it's like, well, people started to think, so that's level two of understanding, let's say. But then people thought about it a little more and they say, well, Actually, it's just bad having mismatched accelerations because that's what your body is measuring. So, so it seems like, that's level three, that since your vestibular system is like an inertial measurement unit, as long as they're matching, then you're, then you're probably okay. So that means moving along at constant velocity, just moving along straight, not turning, and, and moving, so, so moving along at constant velocity, that should be comfortable, right? But you know, I, I'm at level four where I'm not really sure that that's comfortable either. Um, because I don't think we get a lot of experiences where there's no kind of rumble. We're not on a vehicle, and we're just looking down, and the environment's just smoothly moving along, right? So, you know, um, um, sure, maybe uh, maybe on some maglev train it might be smooth enough, and you can look out the window, but I don't know how long I want to look down and see things moving by and, and consider that to be comfortable. So, so I'm, I'm really not completely sure. Um, there's a lot of interesting research directions to go in. Like, for example, one of the things we tried is um, – you can suppose you need to move your avatar forward. You can either move it up gradually to the desired speed, or you can just instantaneously jump to the speed you'd like to move at. Um, counterintuitive to me, at least, the instantaneous jump ended up being more comfortable. Um, it seems to be that the brain is willing to accept a mismatch between your vestibular sense and your visual sense, a very large mismatch for a short amount of time. It seems to discard it as a glitch, like, oh, that's just a hiccup, forget it. But if it's a sustained mismatch that's smaller and happens over a longer period of time, then it starts to be uncomfortable. So I found that very interesting. Um, you know, if you can point and click and teleport where you'd like to go, you um, uh, people in your space here are very comfortable with teleporting. Um, that's just great. If I could teleport in the real world, I might do that. But there's going to be a, a kind of tension between people wanting realism. They want to feel like they're in the real world. And... We want to make experiences comfortable. So striking the right balance is going to be very interesting. So there's all kinds of things you can do to try to improve locomotion. And there are researchers that work on this um, in the context of virtual reality. But I just want to say that, you know, we're, we're getting into this in so many different kinds of ways. And, um, you know, I find this a fascinating area of research to try to make it comfortable, uh, immersive, believable. You feel presence. But um, it's okay to do things a little bit differently, I think. And I think, you, you know, and, and it's important. It's interesting to figure out what these different modes are going to be so that you're quite comfortable um, moving your, your, your avatar around in virtual reality and it doesn't break the presence for you. And it's comfortable at the same time because there's no need to drag people through long vection experiences unless that's just what they signed up for. If you want to go for a virtual roller coaster ride, go for it. Um, speaking of virtual roller coasters, there's, there's an example that I like to give. So there's a lot of people experiencing virtual roller coasters and, and amusement park rides while sitting in a chair. Um, one challenge I've put out to people is to is to is to um, try to build a real roller coaster experience where um, on the roller coaster itself you're just sitting in a chair, right? So the the, the VR experience is to be sitting stationary on on, on a chair um, or on a couch while you're in real life moving on um, a roller coaster or a motion platform. So no one's taken me up on that yet, but um, let's see. Um, in a, in, a, in, a, in a live audience, I, I get lots of chuckles, but I, I don't have the audio channel on. But uh, so I, I don't know if a good sense if I'm making good jokes or not. Let me go to the next slide just in case I'm not. Um, what about tracking your hands, right? So, of course, people want to increase the amount of presence and feeling that you have in virtual reality. And so um, here, there's an image up at the top here of my slide um, from a, a soft kinet kinetic showing at uh, CES this year. Um, so, you know, people are attaching RGBD cameras to, to the Rift or they're putting them in the environment. And it's wonderful. You can bring your hands into the environment. Um, I think there's still a lot of performance and reliability issues in this space, of course. Um, I, I, I suppose it will continue to improve. But I should point out something that's very interesting, uh, that I find very interesting, which is that um, what happens when we get lazy, right? So take the Wii Remote, for example. So there's a couple of pictures here um, 
One is um, an image of uh, folks in a retirement home using the Wii remote to, to get exercise in a bowling experience. And the other image um, I found, um, which is a, a, a comedian called Lazy Wee Guy, which is a guy who sits on a couch and um, is eating pizza in one of the videos and putting the Wii remote between his toes and showing how he can have effective um, use of the Wii remote by actuating as little of his body as possible. And so I think that, again, for comfort and long-term use, we're going to tend towards very simple kinds of motions. And that leads to a very fascinating question, which is, what are the kind of motor programs that are easily learnable? In other words, um, and I'll give a simple example here. Um, take the mouse, right? Who would have thought that um, before ever trying anything like this, that you can move a mouse around on the table, and then when you see the pointer moving around on the screen, I don't know, it sort of feels like our fingers pointing around on the screen, but it's a lot more comfortable than holding our arm up in the air in um, human factors. This is called the gorilla arms problem. Um, you're moving your arm around and you get tired after a few minutes. So with this very simple motion, I feel a lot like I'm pointing around on the screen and it doesn't really seem to affect my sense of doing that. And so I wonder, you know, can I make very simple motions with my hands, my fingers in some kind of way without having to really move my whole arms around? And my brain very quickly can handle that motor program, some very simple kinds of motions. And I just feel or believe like my arms are moving around just fine. I can learn how to grasp things and I'm, and I'm comfortable with that. So these are some things I really wonder about from a human factors, user interfaces, design perspective. Um, what are kind of the, the lazy interfaces that we can make that, um, that work quite well or quite believable and maybe have very high levels of reliability and low amounts of, let's say, technology demands. So, so I think that's um, very interesting. All right. Um, um, another interesting problem, the face-to-face -face problems. Um, so, of course, one of the first things you think about when I, when I, when I thought about my grandma and, and her sister um, and started thinking about developing this technology, I thought, oh, how long will it be before I can get an app together? And then I thought, oh, yeah, my grandma and her sister are going to be looking at each other with um, rectangular bricks strapped to their faces. Um, that's not good. Um, and of course, many, many people talk about this all the time. It's an interesting uh, problem and challenge what to do about the um, about your face if if um, if people are wearing this. And when you think about face to face interaction, the, the competition is going to be uh, video teleconferencing. Right. So um, uh, take blue jeans or Skype or uh, um, other um, um, other platforms for for teleconferencing. You, you feel the presence of people there. You can guess their their mood or how much they're paying attention. You can see if someone's looking down and typing at the keyboard, which I can't see right now too well while I'm looking out at the audience. I don't know who's paying attention or not. It's difficult for me to assess. Um, so um, how real should the avatar be? Um, I took some images here from uh, Paul Dubevic, who strives to make extremely realistic looking uh, faces um, that can be animated for uh, current movies. Um, what if you want that real time on low end platforms? It's gonna be challenging to make interesting, useful animations, effective animations, and of course, we have to be aware of the uncanny valley, which I was quite delighted to see that term being used in virtual reality. I was familiar with it from robotics because we're familiar with that as we try to make humanoid robots. People tried to make them looking more and more realistic, especially in um, East Asian robotics research. Um, and um, they become you know, kind of creepy. And the, the, same, the same thing happens in uh, virtual reality as well. So, um, so I find it really fascinating, again, to think about um, I guess a kind of minimalism, what are the aspects of human um, emotion and attention that need to be communicated in a social setting so that um, we feel like it's really effective and it's, it's, it becomes a great replacement for live face-to-face -face interaction? And um, you know, will that involve capturing um, the motions of your face, the directions your eyes are looking? I think eye tracking ends up being a very interesting problem. <clears throat> you can put cameras inside of a headset, try to track things that's going to capture some amounts of your of your motion. You can capture your eye motions, but your facial motions, your, your facial expressions are certainly going to be altered in some kind of way. You can't capture all of that while you're wearing something on your face. So as the devices shrink over time, that may get better. If virtual reality turns into some small um, eyeglasses that you put on, then it'll be a lot easier, maybe more comfortable. Um, maybe you can judge people's emotions better that way. So, um, so I find this a fascinating topic of research, and I'm sure something that all of you as you work in this Open Simulator platform find interesting. I'm sure you have things to say about that. Um, there is always the question of photorealism in general, and you know, I, and I think this uh, Open Simulator platform and Second Life experiences are um, 
are, are, are great, beautiful virtual environments. And, and it's a great example of how virtual reality doesn't have to be um, trying to simply replace reality. Um, there are going to be a lot of applications where people do want to do virtual traveling um, to feel like they're, they're present in some familiar place or to visit new places and feel like they've actually been there so that maybe two weeks later, they can't really remember very well whether they were there actually in person or whether they were there through some kind of, um, let's say, robotic avatar. Um, a robot surrogate that lets them feel like they were there. Um, so as a roboticist, I find it really fascinating to mix uh, mobile robots. They could be rolling through buildings. They could be flying through the air, which, again, leads to greater challenges in comfort um, of the experience. Um, people are already attaching cameras, GoPros, and omnidirectional cameras to quad rotors. Um, humanoids. Um, there's a humanoid project that's joint between the national labs of France and Japan, where it's been going on for a decade. Um, where uh, researchers have already connected brain-machine interfaces to the humanoid robots. And brain-machine interfaces, you know, it's an up-and-coming area. It's very hard to make them reliable. But nevertheless, it's, it's a cool and exciting sounding area. I mean, there's a lot of interesting possibilities could come out of it. Last I heard, they, they've connected the Oculus Rift to the humanoid and the brain-machine interface. So imagine you could look down at your humanoid body and imagine where you want it to go, and it goes there, and you get to look around while, while, while wearing a virtual reality headset. So that's pretty cool. It's going to be hard to make that all reliably, but, but wow, <laughs> pretty exciting. Um, let me conclude, and then I'll be happy to, to take questions. Um, so the hardware is rapidly improving, and we're doing the best we can. And, and again, mainly to, to raise that baseline of human comfort and safety, and um, you know, especially comfort over, over long experiences. And, um, and of course, we always want to increase the levels of immersion and presence. But again, I want to temper that with how, what exactly do you need for, 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 the, for the task that you're trying to solve? So we have greater realism and better comfort. But again, think about your particular uh, favorite experience and how real it should be. Um, and I said the, the wheel there is, I guess, real enough for the gerbil running along. And we should think about for the particular tasks and the particular types of interactions we want to have, if they're interactions with people or if they're a lone experience. Um, as we think about these, um, what level of, of, of realism is manageable using the technology, is comfortable, and, and really captures the, the pieces that we need to make the experience effective. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Steve. That was wonderful um, and very, very interesting. Um, certainly my, my first experience with the Rift, some of the things that you described, I, I've gotten tangled up in, in, in my cable and I... I um, at one point, I think I was looking at a model of a table that was so realistic, I wanted to look at the underside and banged my head and the rift on a real table in the process. So um, it's definitely worth making sure that you're in a safe space when you uh, and sitting uh, when you um, try the rift. So we have quite a few questions, and I'm just going to head off at the pass because I got probably 20 people asking all the same thing. When will the consumer rift be out? Well, that's that's uh, that's of course the most common uh, question, and um, all I all I can say is about what uh, the, the same remarks that uh, that our CEO Brendan Arib has has made, um, the Oculus CEO Brendan Arib has made um, um, in the last few days, which is that um, you, you know there's Gear VR, which involves our partnership with Samsung for a um, um, smartphone-based VR experience. Um, and that's to be released very, very soon, within a month or two. And the um, full-blown consumer rift um, is on the, let's say, many months scale. And that's about all we can really say at this point. So sorry Which I can I, add more. That's okay. Well, I understand. But I figured I would at least throw the question out there so, so that people could uh, hear what you thought about that. And, you know, in, in terms of, you know, the user experience uh, with the rift, um, one of the most common feedback uh, pieces that I hear when I'm, you know, demoing it um, at, at the University of Cincinnati, you know, people immediately look down to see their, their hands or their, their body, and, and that experience of being bodiless can be very um, sort of disorienting. Do you guys have plans to integrate the hand tracking into the Rift itself? Um, I think it's um, yeah, I think it's premature for me to talk about particular particular plans that that, that involve the platform. But um, I, I'll, I'll say that there's certainly a lot of interest in general as far as R and D goes. Um, you know, they're, they're, we're we're looking at different possibilities, both in Oculus R and D and 
you know, as a researcher, as I talk to researchers all around the, the university community and the industry as well in general, um, you know, it's a very important topic. There, there, there's one thing that, that I want to say about it that's interesting, and I, I want, meant to point out during my talk is that one of the first things I did when I discovered the importance of, just personally discovered the importance of um, perceptual psychology and human factors part of it was to um, hire a couple of perceptual psychologists. So I, so I worked with them, and one of the things I learned from them very quickly was that even just a minimal kind of representation of your body ends up going a long way. Like, um, for example, in a cockpit game, we just rendered a simple torso, and just having that felt a lot better. And there's some literature that supports that in the vision science uh, community. And so I found that was interesting. So, so, so again, I always, I always try to, as, as a researcher, and I've said this a lot in robotics, I always try to warn between confusing something that's necessary with something that's sufficient. So it may be sufficient to track everything and bring that all into the virtual world and match it perfectly. Very, very hard to achieve that. And that may be sufficient, but it's interesting to understand the necessary goals. When can very simple substitutes? So if my if my arm tracking is not perfect, but it's off by a bit, your brain will learn to compensate for that. So it's very interesting. However, if all of a sudden your arm looks like it's broken at the at the elbow, that's very disturbing and it'll be kind of shocking for you. So it's very interesting to figure out what are the the kind of minimal kind of performance criteria, the, the necessary parts that you have to get right to make it comfortable. Um, and we'll all dream of the sufficient criteria, which is to make everything perfect, but it's very interesting to find the necessary pieces. I, in terms of, uh, you know, the user experience, again, we, we're getting lots of questions about those. Um, a lo uh, well, here's a good one. So it seems like many of the demos right now for the Rift are focused on, you know, single player sorts of Unity 3D type applications. Um, you know, in terms of the multi-user experience, which of course for those of us involved in Open Simulator or, or Second Life or, or similar platforms like that, um, it's being in places with others um, that's so that's so compelling. But do you have any thoughts on, on designing or developing for the Rift in in a multi-user environment? Well, that's an excellent question. I, I'm certainly, as I said in some of the motivation in my talk, I'm very interested in um, allowing this technology to 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 connect people, to connect people all over the world. It's very exciting, you know, to me to be able to do that. I personally love traveling. I love culture. And, and, and I, I love the idea of um, you know, pushing further in this area. Um, when I think about the technical challenges, I, I feel like we're overwhelmed in many ways with the technical challenges of just getting single person experiences working well and being comfortable. And um, you know, latency, of course, is one of the biggest issues. And when you now uh, connect people over, over a medium, um, um, when, when you connect people over the, over the internet, let's say, and you want to have uh, networked experiences, um, it's, it's going to involve, you know, uh, cleverness in hiding or dealing with the problems of latency. You can just demand that the, 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 the latency problems should go away by better technology, and the Internet will continue to improve, and people are going to do research on that and try to improve it at all levels, improve bandwidth and, and you know, transmission rates. Um, but, um, um, but that ends up being just, just another set of challenges, let's say. So I don't think there's any shortage of enthusiasm for this. It's just, um, you know, we're still in many ways in the – even though VR has been around for a long time, this rebirth of VR is still in its, I would say, earlier stages where if we try to tackle things that involve an even greater sets of challenges, it may turn people off too quickly if it's not a comfortable experience. So that it scares me a bunch with the with the extra latency and some of the additional challenges. So that's just one thing I'll warn about. I, I guess that for people wanting to get into the space, I guess just try to heed my warnings about um, about the human side of it and to make sure that whatever we're building, it's comfortable. So if um, walking your avatar along in Open Simulator is comfortable on the screen, I don't think it will be very much um, in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in the VR case. So think about how to adapt that. So just kind of go through things systematically is what I would encourage developers to do and try to assess the comfort of these things rather than just saying, ah, the code's already there. I can jump in and hack this in a few hours and it'll be great. That's definitely true. Some of the environments that my team has developed um, at the university, there are so many issues with even things like scale, an environment that I've looked at on the 2D screen a million times and everything looks fine. Um, and then you, you get in with the rift and you realize, geez, that refrigerator was built for a giant. Um, so, you know, lots of lots of issues with making sure that the, the actual experience the person has with the Rift, and, and I don't know if you have the opportunity later today, Steve, um, to walk around this conference venue uh, with the Rift. Um, I'll be interested to see what, what you think, and we may also have giant couches or something, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> that would be fun to try. It, it is. Um, so, 
in terms of, you know, people are often, well, I'll, I'll phrase it this way. In my experience, when I'm introducing the topics of virtual reality or virtual worlds um, to people who are unfamiliar, there seem to be almost two camps that people instinctively either are excited and curious and kind of want to dive in. And then there's another sort of group of people who are very, I have a very strong sort of fear response. Um, they're not sure what it is and, and they seem afraid to even, even try it. Um, do you have a similar experience when you're talking about this technology with others? And what, um, what do you say to those who are a little afraid of even trying VR? Hmm. That's, that's very interesting. I, I think um, I, I'm, I'm an unusual person in that I, I'm, well, there's, there's plenty of people like me perhaps, but, but I, I tend to um, be surrounded by a lot of technolo technology oriented people. So, um, and, and spend most of my time inside the company hacking code like crazy, you know, <laughs> working on the nitty gritty things. And so anybody that would come by and visit was already pretty excited and wanted to try things. So I probably don't have a very good, you know, in the statistical sampling sense, a good se a sense of what the audience, uh, potential audience is like. It's interesting though. I, I am I am old enough to to remember people fearing computers in the '80s, and I was a teenager excited about hacking on home PCs like the TI 994A and Commodore 64 and stuff like that. And I do remember people fearing computers in some way. And as a roboticist, I have a lot. You know, I've definitely been aware of people fearing robotics, like it's gonna. Um, um, well, it, it, aside from maybe a, a robot revolution where they might take over the world and, and, and kill us off, um, probably not too realistic of a fear, but people do have maybe practical fears about robots replacing their jobs and things like that. And so um, that's very interesting that you asked the question because I haven't, I haven't come up with a lot of that in virtual reality. I, I, I think that um, I think it is reasonable to have a little bit of fear about the comfort levels, right? Because it's very mm -hmm. interesting for someone to hook up the, the, the headset and give somebody a horrible experience in Vection in a carefree way, and, and if someone's a novice at it, you might say, oh, I'll use the keypad and I'll move you around in Tuscany. Don't worry, I'll take care of that for you. And if you're not controlling the motion yourself, then it's even worse, right? And so um, so, 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 so that's one thing that, you know, I guess, you know, for anybody who, who is trying to introduce it to uh, family, friends, other folks that, that are far away from this technology, <clears throat> at least make sure that you're easing them in gently into something comfortable like VR cinema, or if it's in a, a basic place, um, try not to do locomotion for a while until they're comfortable. Well, that's a really good tip, and I, I think we learned that the hard way as well. You know, we, as much as possible, we try to let the user control their own experience because I think it's that unexpected uh, movement that that really can intensify the disorientation. Do you think that you know are are there are there um, other ways that people learn to use the Rift? Or I, I sort of have had the experience myself where, you know, maybe initially it's disorienting, but, you know, after a few minutes it gets better. Um, are, are there things that you can do other than um, the environment itself or the way the, the avatar moves to help lessen that, that, um, that disorientation feeling? Um, yeah, I mean, that, well, s certainly our, our goal for, for those of us at Oculus and others in this in this rising industry, we have to make the hardware as comfortable as possible, right? So, um, so, 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 so that's one sort of part of it. Um, in, in terms of just um, um, alternatives to improving locomotion, um, um, so, so, so I think that... Um, um, you know, from, from a developer side, like... Right, right, is, I, I'm is, thinking about it, yeah. yeah. So, 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 I, so I think that... Um, one thing that's also known is that if you give them a task to do, so if you focus their attention on something, um, it's kind of like they say if you're seasick, look at the horizon or something. I don't know if that works or not, but um, but 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 um, it never works for me when I'm getting seasick. But um, but it, it, if you if you give people a task to focus on, we've noticed that they tend to be less susceptible to the effects. So so you have a lot of opportunity through the visual stimulation you give them to give the, the, the user, you have a lot of opportunity to guide them in some way. And so if the experience does require some optical flow that's mismatched in some way, um, it may be that the task that, that you're getting them to do, like, I don't know, something ridiculous, maybe like threading a needle, but you can't do that at that resolution, but say you wanna stack some blocks or something, um, or operate some levers or some kind of thing like that, focusing on that task might help take the brain's attention away from some of the mismatch. So, um, so, so that's one potential for, one, one opportunity there. That's a really good idea and a, a good tip. I don't know that um, that I've done that enough, and I'm sure there are other developers here that can use that advice to, um, particularly for the first introduction, to help sort of ease folks into that. 
Um, yesterday, uh, sort of switching gears a little bit, yesterday we had uh, Philip Rosedale of High Fidelity, I, I think you mentioned him and, and that you're a little familiar with, with his work, um, here talking about, uh, you know, this concept of the metaverse, of connected worlds. Um, when you think about the future of, of where Oculus, you know, VR is going as a company and, and the technology itself, um, you know, what do you think that that looks like? If you project out, are we five years away? Are we 10 years away? Is it closer than that for people to actually travel, you know, between worlds in a very immersed way? That's, that's a very good question. I guess I, um, I tend to think, you know, given my decades of experience as a researcher, I tend to be very hesitant to make predictions because um, I, I know that, that R&D is full of surprises all the time. And um, as far as what advances on the technology side, like how, at what rate will the, um, will the, let's say, data transmission rates that we have at all levels, all the way down to, to you know, chip level um, abilities to handle data, all, all the way up to internet, um, at what rate will these things advance? How will people be motivated to have that? How will the, the, the transfer rates <clears throat> increase in people's homes? You know, some of these will happen for various reasons that are not purely technology limitations, but may have to do with politics and business reasons and other kinds of things. So, so there's a lot of factors that make it difficult to predict. I think, um, I, I, I think, I think that it's. Um, I think another way to look at it too is that um, it may not be too hard to make such an experience um, and such kind of interconnectivity w w within a couple of years, but getting the quality level really high and being able to support millions of users doing it all at one time in, in some kind of shared space that's all interconnected. Um, I, it's going to take an awful long, it's gonna take an awful long time. So it's very interesting, I guess, because as it gets exciting, people will start going into it and then um, they'll clog up the bandwidth and, and it, that may cause people to back off from it quite a bit, right? So, um, and so that makes it really hard for me to speculate. Sorry that's, if I didn't answer it too well, but that's no, no, that's how I that's that's a fair answer. I think that's a very fair answer. Um, you know, one of the questions that drives me crazy that that I get asked often is is what's the killer app for virtual reality? What's what's the use case here? Um, because I, you know, for me anyway, I, I often think what's the use case for real life? You know, all the things that we do in real life, you know, those are the use cases for virtual reality. But that isn't always the case. There are some things. Um, that that VR does very well, and other things that yeah, maybe not so much. Do you, when you think of the best use cases that you've seen so far with the Rift, can you give us maybe some other examples? What's the best sort of things that you've seen done with the Rift? That's that's a very interesting question, and and um, I, I continue to be surprised to the point where where, where I will say that. Um, um, the most interesting experience are, are yet to be discovered, and they're most likely discovered by people who don't have a lot of preconceived notions about what virtuality is supposed to be good for. Like, for example, if you're a very experienced developer of first-person shooter games, you may have a preconceived notion that leverages your background and experience, but but that but that's that that that, that pull, it pulls you a certain way. If you're very experienced with uh, Second Life and Open Simulator, it again will will bias you in a certain way. But, but I'm, I continue to be fascinated by people who just um, uh, especially younger people or people who are new to this area altogether, they, they come up with something um, very surprising, surprising and innovative. One of the things that really struck me as an example was uh, virtual reality cinema. Um, so um, this one was made just a few weeks after our Unity. Unity's made it easy for, you know, the, the middleware has made it really great for people to make experiences quickly, which lowering the barrier to entry made this happen fast. So within a few weeks, um, we, we found this app of uh, virtual uh, cinema um, which was made by a young man in South Korea, and um, he, he now works in the company and has continued to, to refine and advance and develop virtual reality cinema. But when I first heard it, I thought, oh, that sounds kind of lame. What, you sit in a virtual movie theater and you watch movies? Why would anybody do that? But then um, I tried it, and I tried it on and, uh, my, my, my sons. I tried it on them as well, and, and, and that was the only experience that they really sat there comfortably for a long time watching uh, movies and, and feeling kind of relaxed. And... Um, it was really interesting to me because, first of all, it leverages all of the media that's already out there. So there's all there's all kinds of movies out there, and you don't have to do anything to them to just show them in 2D or 3D on a virtual movie theater. So you're leveraging a bunch of content that's already there, and you're providing a very relaxing experience. And later, after talking to a lot of people from East Asia, um, especially ones that live in crowded cities like Tokyo, Seoul, Shanghai, you know, the, um, they have very limited space. And so the ability to just relax in a big movie theater or to build a big virtual mansion for themselves to just hang out in and maybe meet a friend or two ends up be being being really, really a great experience that 
well, we were trying to increase the intensity here in the U.S. of, of the experiences and such. And so someone going, um, making this kind of basic realization experience, you know, it, it, it was a reflection of their culture, of the kind of things they wanted to do with it. And I found that really fascinating. So I expect to see lots more stuff like that. And it's especially interesting in this case, as I said, that it leverages the existing technology. So if you want to make then a virtual uh, movie theater experience where, you know, maybe you're watching, say, the old movie Twister, where there's tornadoes on the screen, but then as a little kind of fun gag, the theater rips apart, you know, in, in the middle of one of the tornado <laughs> scenes. Or you're watching a zombie movie and then you turn around and, oh, my God, there's zombies coming after me. Uh, it's great the things you can do without even disrupting the content that's on the screen, right? So you can just add these experiences as annotations. That's fantastic. And, you know, we often talk about that even in even in the 2D virtual environment that, um, you know, I've been working in this space for, for more than a decade now. And uh, often the most surprising limitation is, at the moment, our own imaginations. It's sometimes hard to even fathom all the things that you could do in virtual reality. Um, so I think I agree with you in the sense I, I think that um, the best experiences are really, you know, yet to come. Um, and I can't wait to see them. Yeah, imagine what Hollywood's going to do. It's going to be incredible. <laughs> it, it will be. It will be. Um, so, the, so those are the sort of positive, sort of hopeful things. I, I always like to ask, you know, what are the things, you know, in terms of, uh, of the rift and the technology and the use of it, what are the things that keep you up at night? What are you worried about? You know, what are the biggest challenges that you think that we need to overcome in order to really successfully bring this to a mainstream audience? What, what are you worried about? Um, I, I think this, that's a very good question, and I, and I, I think my, my talk reflected that to a large extent, which is um, the human factors part is what I worry about the most, um, that we're, we're running in with a lot of enthusiasm. This is a great consequence of lowering the barrier to entry. Um, the, the proponents of open source software lower the barrier to entry. You know, people are doing all these things. It's great. You know, so if you can get cheap hardware, people jump in. And so um, making sure that, 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 that the human comfort side is, is respected and the technology, the hardware technology that we develop continues to improve that, but also the content that people make, if all that goes along, it's great. Because, of course, the thing that keeps up a lot of people who have been dreaming about VR for a very long time, especially people who were, who were into it back in the 80s and 90s, is that here we go again. Is, are we setting up for another failure? So um, if, if it were to fail, it would most likely be because these issues of, of uh, human comfort, uh, human factors, were not taken seriously enough. I think these are addressable problems, addressable issues, but if we're falling behind on them too quickly while all kinds of uncomfortable content is made in a very fast way, then, then, then um, you know, we might be overwhelmed, and that, and that may give the whole, um, as people have their first tastes of virtual reality, if that ends up being uncomfortable, then um, it, it, I, I'm afraid that that might doom the whole movement, which would be a bummer because the technology is there, and we do scientifically understand the causes for uh, discomfort. It's just a matter of getting it to the right people, especially to um, the excited developers and enthusiasts at all levels that are giving people their first experiences. Which, which is a good question. You know, if you are, it, for all the folks here in the audience or watching on the web stream or, or who may watch this later, um, is there any good resource that you know of? You know, is there some place on the web that developers should be sure to check for, you know, the best um, sort of design uh, ideas and tips and tricks? Are, are there any good resources that you're aware of that people should be checking to make sure they're designing good experiences? That's a very good question. I mean, we we, um, we took that seriously within the company and worked hard on a uh, best practices guide. So you can look for the Oculus best practices guide and download that and look through it. Um, um, that was worked on by a number of people, including experienced game developers and perceptual psychologists, myself, several other people uh, contributed to that. So that's very important. Um, <clears throat> there's also looking around on the on the on the forums and you know, we have a developer forum in Oculus. And of course, there's forums around the around the world. Um, just you know, I just try to emphasize, you know, be careful. There's a lot of noise out there, just like when you do any kind of search, you know, there's, there's, um, you'll find all kinds of uh, opposing views, conflicted opinions and things. And so I tend to gravitate more towards scientifically, uh, scientific published articles. However, it's hard to get a lot of those given the latest wave of technology. So one of the most interesting questions is if a study was done in the 90s, say about virtual reality, um, what aspects of that will almost certainly remain true today using the current technology and which parts of it need to be redone or need to be reinvestigated. And so that's a very interesting kind of question. And I think a lot of people who work in human factors, vision science, virtual reality, graphics are, are asking questions about you know, exactly this. What, what, what do we really need to study right now 
to to improve our understanding to make sure that we um, don't don't uh, ha jump into any uh, pitfalls. Thank you. That's a that's a really great tip, and I did uh, I did paste that uh, link into chat, and we'll be sure to send that out through our Twitter stream as well uh, for developers. Thank you. Um, so we're coming to the end of our our time here, and a, as sort of a closing question. Um, this is the second annual Open Simulator Conference, and um, knock on wood, we'll be back again uh, this time next year. You know, thinking just in a much more shorter term, I know that it's hard to get scientists to make predictions, but, you know, if you imagine, you know, a year from now, where do you hope that, that we'll be in terms of VR and the Rift? You know, what do you think is reasonable without, you know, getting into too much detail? Um, what do you think is reasonable that we can expect to be um, to see next time this this time around? Hmm. Well, I, I I I don't. It's very hard to say what's reasonable, but I but I think that um, you know I I would be very excited, and I think it's within reach to have um, hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of people um, um, having VR experiences. Um, lots of devices out there in a year should be possible. As I said, we have. I guess a lot of that will will, will hinge on. Um, um, the, the the success or failure of the um, um, of the Gear VR launch that we have coming up. So so I'm hoping that will put VR into many many more people's hands and give people a lot of interesting basic experiences. So so um, you know a year from now I, I I think we'll still be on that that rising uh, cusp. Things will keep going up and uh, awareness will continue to increase and hopefully the demand for VR content will continue to be on the rise. That's wonderful, and and uh, I think the Gear VR. That can you explain for if for so folks that may not know, that's with a with a mobile device. That's correct. Yes, it's with um, um, one of Samsung's uh, latest mobile devices, and then it's an extra piece that you buy if you if you if you have the mobile device. Then it's an extra piece that you buy that contains some extra um, uh, sensor technology, and altogether, there's been software that's been worked on collaboratively between uh, Oculus and Samsung that sort of makes it all work. Um, so, and, and in addition, yeah, there's also, I guess, optics as well, because it's an extra device. It's a device that you insert the smartphone into. Well, that's really terrific. And um, thank you so much for coming today, Steve. This was really a wonderful, um, for those who may not know, an introduction to some of the more technical challenges, but also lots of great information uh, for the developers in the audience. I think many people here are hoping that we can help provide some of the content um, that people will experience um, through the Rift. So thank you so much for being here today. It was really a pleasure to have you. Well, thank you very much for the invitation and good luck to everybody out there. It's, uh, these are very exciting times for sure. Indeed. Thank you so much. And thank you to our audience for um, a, a many terrific questions. Um, just as a reminder, uh, so we're almost at the end of the keynote session. We have a 30-minute coffee break uh, for those who need to get up and stretch your legs a bit. And then we'll be returning with the first round of breakout sessions. Those sessions will be held in the breakout tracks. So if you open your map here in World, you'll notice that the breakout regions are just south of the keynotes where we are now. Uh, there will be tracks in the business, community, developers, education, and learning lab. And you can teleport to those regions either from your in-world map or the maps um, in the region here. You can also be sure to check out the rest of the day's events on the conference program at conference.opensimulator.org. And be sure to tweet your questions, comments, and feedback to at OpenSimCC on Twitter. Thank you again, Steve. We really enjoyed having you. And thanks, everyone. Enjoy your break. We'll see you uh, in about 30 minutes. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>